Good morning, everyone. Um, it's an early morning, but at least it's very nice to see an uh, audience here already. I'll start with something. Coffee Lab, Brew Lab, Creative Lab, Digital Lab, Information Lab, Digital Humanities Lab, Design and Critical Design Lab, 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 Media Lab, Media Theory Lab, Sense Lab, there's no lack of labs. Hence, welcome to our panel on labs, on labs in humanities and media. Uh, my name is Jussi Parikk. I work at the University of Southampton Winchester School of Art. I'm moderating the panel and I'll give just a tiny bit of introduction before we go to our speakers who I will introduce. Um, what's going to happen today is that we're going to have uh, five great speakers with short interventions, short talks, and more of a conversation. Conversation between us, but also we of course invite you to participate. So we got for the whole panel one and a half hours, um, and I'll introduce everyone. Basically, of course, as you might have seen from the titles and the panel description, the panel investigates the idea, practice, and spatialities of labs as a formation of knowledge in contemporary art and humanities. We want to engage with the theory, or techniques of theory, we one could say, but one that attaches to special places and infrastructures and affordances of labs. Of what, what do labs enable us to do, and why do we talk of labs? It's a term that emerges, and a practice that emerges from alchemy to modern science and chemical practice. It characterizes most of the 20th century as a key site of investment and research. Cold War labs are the backbone of much of digital culture already. Now we suddenly seem to be returning to this legacy, but in new ways. Studio labs as sites of invention was something that's mentioned already in the first talk kind of returning back to um, Michael Century's 1999 report and as a, as a kind of a key side of invention or creation since 1990s. And we still really seem to be living in a similar kind of enthusiasm around the lab and its connections to other practices, as we will see, from art to, to, to media and humanities. Um, as mentioned, we're having, we, we have Five speakers today, I'll introduce everyone, and the follow we'll do this in the following order. We'll start with Laurie Emerson, followed up by Stefan Hultgen. Um, after that, Darren Welshler, Jesper Olsson, and Joasha Krissa. Um, our first speaker today is, um, let me get my notes, Laurie Emerson, who I've had the pleasure to collaborate with on many projects already. Um, Laurie runs the Media Archaeology Lab in Boulder, um, Colorado, University of Colorado, and she's an associate professor of English literature and intermediate arts. Um, besides directing the lab, um, she's the author of Reading Writing Interfaces from the Digital to the Book Bound, a book I can warmly recommend that was published by University of Minnesota Press in 2014. My introductions will be short because I want to leave more time for people. Laurie's, gonna be, Laurie's topic today is Theory and Practice of Post Humanities in Media Archaeology Lab. Um, so it's all yours, Laurie. Okay. Um. I want to begin by thanking Yusi for putting together this panel of people I really admire and respect and some of whom I've not met until today. Um, and thanks to everybody for coming to our panel on a Saturday morning. <clears throat> I'm going to talk first about uh, why there's been such a, a sudden proliferation of labs in the arts and humanities in the last five years or so, and then I'll move on specifically to talk about the Media Archaeology Lab. Uh, with apologies to people that saw me talk on Thursday because I am going to repeat some of the same content. Um, in the last five years, I've, I've seen the number of labs surge in North America in the humanities to at least the hundreds. Um, and I, I think that it really reflects a sea change in how people are trying in the humanities with varying degrees of success to move away from a 19th century model of academic work that's typified by the single scholar who works carefully within the confines of their discipline uh, in the boundaries of a self-contained office, working on single authored books that promote a clearly defined set of ideas. And instead, I think the term lab, rather than any other term like innovation or interdisciplinary or collaborative, helps humanists really put into better focus 
Um, there are other, otherwise unformed desires for a mode of knowledge production that's appropriate to the 21st century. So some of the things that I think uh, people are working towards who are creating these labs are uh, n uh, knowledge production that's quick on its feet, that's responsive, that's conversational, that's emergent, uh, transparent, self-conscious, and archivally oriented about recording its knowledge production process, and that's also experimental about what constitutes a rigorous knowledge production and distribution process as well. And I think these are perhaps by now tired cliches of the kind of work that all of us would like to do um, and that many of us believe we do, that administrators would like to see us do, but it's worth emphasizing that I think actually very few of us actually do this sort of work. Um, and I think the hope of a lot of humanists is that labs will, will help make this happen and will help legitimize this sort of work. Which brings me to my second reason for this trend in creating labs for anything and everything. It also reflects economic pressures and the ways in which humanists are being forced to legitimize and even pre-legitimize what we're doing as we're increasingly under pressure to perform. And I think, uh, importantly, we're under pressure to prove we're performing, even if the performance itself doesn't bear any relation to the proof of the performance. And where else do we get our ideas of what constitutes proof, but from no, some notion of how uh, the sciences are in the business of proving the rightness or wrongness of theories about reality by way of the discovery of facts that more often than not takes place in a laboratory environment. And as uh, many people from SDS since at least the 1970s have been teaching us, these notions about proof and the scientific method don't need to have any grounding in how scientific truth is actually produced or manufactured. It's more about trying to figure out why the continual circulation of a particular cultural belief is necessary. And I've come to see that the same power about this belief uh, in the nature of proof and scientific practice is about the importance of maintaining belief in humanism, even though it appears that we're just talking about science. A belief about how scientists discover truth depends on the related belief that scientists are not affected by the agency of their tools, machines, the outside world, and other people. And this is a belief that's just as much a part of the humanities as it is a part of the sciences. For the prevailing belief in the humanities seems to be that humanists are also not affected by their tools, machines, the outside world, and other people. Microsoft Word is just a tool that you use to produce articles and books, for example. Google is simply a search engine you use to discover relevant information. The graphical user interface just happens to be the easiest way for you to interact with your computer, and so on. And if you want proof of uh, what I'm saying, uh, all you need to do is look at the uh, reward structures of nearly every university in North America. Uh, regardless of this constant admonition to innovate and collaborate and so on and so forth, at the end of the day, raises appointments, ability to get jobs, depends on continually manufacturing the illusion of a clear separation between ourselves, uh, others, and the rest of the material world. So basically what I'm, uh, I'm noticing is that as humanities labs proliferate, they often do so while appropriating a very traditional notion of the structure and functioning of a lab from the sciences as a way to continue humanism, but under the auspices of innovation. It's a very strange paradox. At the same time as this trend unfolds, I've been interested in using the Media Archaeology Lab in particular as a way to develop uh, a model for what a uniquely humanities lab might look like, one that does not uh, simply appropriate from the sciences, or if it does, it does self-consciously. And it does in order to become a platform for post-humanities or work in the post-human. So let me start by, or move on by talking about the MAL. I created the uh, Media Archaeology Lab in 2009, and at that time I called it the Archaeological Media Lab, not knowing that there was such a field as media archaeology. Um, and at that time, I created it as a way to work through the problems of preservation and access in digital literature. And I'd been fortunate to have been given some 
I suppose you could call them manuscript versions of early uh, important work by B.P. Nichol, who created the, one of the first digital kinetic poems in 1982-1983 on an Apple IIe computer. Um, but uh, it didn't take too long f before I moved on from collecting Apple IIe computers and early digital literature and art to just being focused on the uh, material itself. So then I moved on to Commodore 64s and that was the beginning of the end. Um, in 2012, um, after department administrative assistance arranged for a miraculous space exchange that gave the lab a, an entire thousand square foot uh, basement level of an old house, um, the lab really exploded into what it is now. This piece runs for another 15 minutes, so I'm sorry, I have to, I have to move on. Um, let me just run through some, some pictures of things that we have in the lab. I think uh, initially our strength was in the history of personal computing. Um, so we have a fantastic collection of computers from 1976 to the late 90s. Um, but then as time went on, I became more and more interested in um, setting early analog media side by side, uh, some of these later, later pieces. So we have magic lanterns, projectors. Uh, we have a, an Edison diamond disc phonograph from 1912 that I found in a furniture store in Boulder for $175. We have an Altair 8800B, which is an 8-bit computer, works with switches, and I really adore that computer. It's our Apple computers. We have both, uh, I guess, mainstream computers as well as oddities, and I think it's really important to have both of these sitting side by side. Gaming consoles. Typewriters, printed matter, manuals, um, all kinds of documentation going back to the 1950s in humanities computing at that time. And we've also been working on getting a disk imaging station up and running so that we can um, also protect our holdings. So let me run through some things that you can do in the lab. You can stage hands-on teaching and research on anything related to media and inscription devices. Um, you can work on early digital literature and art. Uh, scanners and digitization, video game ROM hacking, uh, or you can do research on early interfaces or early networks. You can also come to the lab for training on how to accession and catalog while also collaborating on creating metadata schemes to describe our holdings. Um, that's been a really interesting experiment to think about how description affects uh, our sense of what objects are. Um, you can also undertake artistic and writerly projects and interventions. Um, some of you here know Mel Hogan. Uh, Mel Hogan came to work with me in the Media Archaeology Lab a couple years ago from Montreal, and she started up our artist residency program, which was a phenomenal success. Uh, the first year that we ran the artist residency series, I think we had uh, somewhere around the uh, area of 12 to 15 artists coming from all over the world to work in the lab. So I have some images of things that we do in the lab. This was a distributed uh, installation of a work of electronic literature that was spread across multiple computers in the lab. We've also had people work on traditional, in some sense, installation or exhibit dealing with the, uh, the, the external design of objects in the lab. And Matt Soares, who some of you may know, also came to the lab and did some work on colors of machines in the lab. So in short, I think the MAL is unique for a number of reasons. 
Um, rather than being hierarchical and classificatory, both in its display or its organization of objects as well as people, I tried to make it porous, flat, and branching. Um, objects are organized in any way that participants want. Everything is functional and made uh, to be turned on and played with and tinkered with. Also, rather than setting out to adhere to specific outcomes and five-year plans, uh, we change from semester to semester and year to year, depending on who's spending time in the lab. Um, rather than being an entity that you need to apply to, to be a part of, or something that you can only participate in if you are a, an officially sanctioned researcher or a PhD student, uh, anyone can participate in the lab and have a say about what projects we take on and what kinds of work we do. Also, rather than being about the display of precious objects where you only get a sense of the external appearance or the external functionality of the objects, uh, again, we encourage people to tinker, play, open things up, and even disassemble the machines that we have. Uh, this leads to, to the fact that rather than perpetuating uh, neat historical narratives about how things came to be, we encourage an experimental approach to time. So for example, we encourage people to put Edison discs uh, that come with big warning labels about how you may not play that Edison disc on a Victrola. Uh, otherwise terrible things will happen. Uh, put those disks up beside contemporary proprietary software, or maybe put uh, our Vectrex gaming console that comes with a light pen up next to a contemporary tablet and stylus. And then finally, rather than participating in the process of erasing the knowledge production process, or rather than uh, perpetuating the illusion of a separation between those who work in the lab and the machines they work on, and hiding the agency of the machines themselves, as well as the agency of the larger infrastructure of the lab, we're constantly interested in situating anything and everything we do in the lab and being self-conscious and descriptive about the minute particularities of the production process for any projects we undertake. Again, as I, I started out saying, um, it's my hope that the MAL can be a tool for moving away from humanism and traditional humanities work and instead tentatively, provisionally model what post-humanities work might look like. Thank you everyone for your attention. Um, thank you, Laurie. Um, we need to move to our next speaker. I would propose that hold off on questions. Let's address questions and discussion at the end. We'll go directly to our next second intervention short talk. It um, gives me pleasure to introduce Dr. Stefan Höldken from Berlin. Um, Stefan works at the Media Studies Institute at Humboldt University in Berlin. He works closely with Wolfgang Ernst. Um, Stefan's work relates to various fields in film and media studies, but he's been very active on the retro computing scene, both as an organizer, workshop organizer, and as a scholar as well. And very significantly for this talk as well, he's the curator um, for uh, both the Media Archaeological Fundus, but especially also the Signal Laboratory, and I understand that we're especially going to be talking about Signal Laboratory, laboratory so welcome, Stefan. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I want to give you an insight in the next minutes into our concepts of our signal laboratory and um, especially the combination of teaching and researching which is uh, combined by Wilhelm von Humboldt um, um, and uh, performed by our, by our um, professor Wolfgang Ernst and his staff. Um, I will tell you something about me. Um, my, I'm from the um, literature, I'm a humanities, uh, former humanities student and um, did, did my PhD on film um, and then I changed from, from Bonn to Berlin and uh, got that job at Wolfgang Ernst at Media Studies and he uh, asked me to run the Signal Laboratory which was until then kind of looting, uh, uh, soldering place. And um, I built a collection of computers, microcomputers, analog computers, and other stuff, um, and um, 
thought about a teaching concept um, to teach media students in programming, soldering, electronics, mathematics, informatics, logic, and so on. I'm curating both um, the Media Archaeological Fundus, which you have seen two days ago, perhaps, in a speech from UC. He had some pictures. And the Signal Laboratory. Today I want to speak um, merely about the Signal Laboratory. Um, our, studio pro uh, our studies, uh, um, our, our deg degree program um, um, holds both Bachelor of Arts and uh, Master of Arts. Bachelor of Arts you can only study as a minor subject, um, but, but with all the contents of our media theory and other things. And the um, master uh, program is a main subject and all the students have to choose from one of these focuses and our focus is the media theory focus. Um, the chair for media theories, perhaps you heard about him, Wolfgang Ernst, um, is about the theory of media, about media archaeology and epistemology, and techno-mathematics of media. Um, he is interested in sonic media, archive theory, media and time, and other topics you can read in translated books. Some of them are translated into English. Um, I am at the field of time-based media and time-critical media processes that are all media which operating with time, and as you know, all media are operating with time, but my focus is to um, show that the time processes are different from like uh, continuous time, uh, uh, times in computers and so on. Um, um, I am teaching um, computer history and programming, as I said, logic to um, uh, mathematics, electronics to all of the students. Um, there is a, a portal um, a module for the bachelor student, the module one, they have to go through. So uh, all of them have to learn to program computers uh, before they can start to learn what media science and media studies is. Mm, this is um, the Media Archaeological Fundus. Um, it collects all kinds of media hardware and components. I uh, wrote components and um, equations because um, there are clocks and toys and other things that you can compare with components of real media to show how like signal processing, uh, time processing, and so on uh, um, uh, goes on in media. Um, here on the picture you can see one of our yearly events, the Fundus Fundamentalis. This is a kind of um, concert, electronic music concert, noise concert that happens into the Fundus. Here are one, uh, two of our colleagues who did uh, some kind of noise loop music. Mm. The Signal Laboratory collects digital computers um, from like Laurie Emerson's uh, um, collection, it's very similar from the 1960s to the 1990s. From the 60s are more the analog computers, uh, the late 60s, and then the early microcomputers, 4-bit, 8-bit, and 16-bit computers. All of them are working, like at the Media Archaeology Lab. And um, especially, the special focus is on home com the so-called home computers. That's the computers from the midst of the 70s to the midst of the 80s. Um, the, the Signal Laboratory is also a workplace for students. They can do their own projects, repair things, uh, learning to program by themselves or in courses, analyzing media hardware from the fundus and so on. Um, some of the activities in our, in our courses, here is the bachelor, uh, for the bachelor students are, um, and they are all hands-on courses, they are all combined with programming and other things like uh, uh, Pac-Man studies, we did a whole semester on Pac-Man from the program code to the circuits of the Pac-Man um, machine or um, logic from Aristotle to the 4-bit CPU. They have to learn the classical logic like in mathematics and go on through Boole, uh, Boole and uh, Shannon and then into um, constructing arithmetic logical units. Um, applied game theory, the, the theory of games uh, um, applied to computer games. This is a project I'm doing right now with the bachelor students. Computer graphics and the next semester is 
dedicated to the Commodore 64. All of the students will get one Commodore 64 and learn what this machine is, its history, its programming, its electronics, and so on. Um, here's some outcome from the bachelor's, uh, from the bachelor courses. This is uh, one exhibition we did uh, on computer graphics. Uh, one of our art more artistic students uh, uh, did this um, with Koala Pet and Commodore 64. Mm, this is from the uh, picture from the course Hands-on Retro Computing. I think I did it in 2013. Um, every student had to pick one of the early home computers, retro computers, to learn about them. The uh, paradigm was, uh, think um, it is Christmas and you found this computer under the Christmas tree and now you don't know anyone else who has this computer, learn about it. And they had one semester and um, the goal was to write an own manual on this computer and the scene and the cultures and the programming and so on. Um, this is from the Pac-Man studies, uh, from the Pac-Man studies course. Um, two of the students are playing the um, uh, the Pac-Man board, this is an original um, arcade board from the Pac-Man arcade machine. Um, we learned the, uh, the art architecture of that board, um, what kind of RAM and ROM it uses, uh, what kind of program, what kind of code it is written in. It's one of the first computer games written in uh, assembly code and not in, with, dedicated, um, with dedicated circuits. Um, the master courses are a bit more abstract, but on, also hands-on, like Cold War media and science fiction and computing, the interconnection between computer science fictions and the um, imagination of computers in the 50s and 60s from like DARPA and ARPA and um, uh, other think tanks. Then the hands-on history of hacking. Um, we read about hacking, hackers, and uh, the former hacking scenes at MIT and in Germany, the KS Computer Club perhaps is uh, uh, known. And um, then they had to hack themselves <laughs> into some systems. We, had, we have, I've got a friend in, in the near Frankfurt who has a huge collection of PDP and other deck machines and he uh, started one of his PDP-11 and uh, put it on the net so the, um, uh, the students could log in and uh, work, around, uh, work around with the uh, esoteric uh, operation system. Um, the history of the microprocessor was um, a, f a course about um, the architecture, the, the history of the architectures of microprocessors and the programming tool. All the students have had to pick one of the microprocessors and learn how to program them on the platforms at the Signal Laboratory and so on. And this is one of the pictures from the microprocessor course. Um, we wrote assembly codes for mu multiplying two digits and then we read it from the memory and oh, okay, the, uh, the result was clear, but uh, how, um, um, how's the result looking at the circuitry? So we uh, put a uh, logic analyzer to the, uh, to the board and measured the output of the data port um, as the computer multiplies two digits and this is the kind of um, archaeology uh, thinking we want to um, give our students that um, there's not only the surface of media but the subface too and in this subface uh, there are the things, the hidden things to learn about computer and computer technology um, and they are very similar from the 1940s to the iPhone age we are in so um, um, it's some kind of uh, re-enlightenment about computer technology for users. Um, there are other courses. There's a weekly assembly programming course I am giving on different, changing every semester on different um, 4, 8, and 16-bit microprocessors. Um, um, there is a summer school on extinct programming languages. I gave um, courses about fourth and about C. C is not an extinct language, but I'm planning to do COBOL and Fortran and Algo too um, the next summer. And an um, um, interesting point is, are the other activities at the Signal Laboratory, they suddenly appeared, let's say, um, as a kind of outgrowth from the teaching there. Students came to the Signal Laboratory with own ideas for projects and for, for uh, meetings. So there is, uh, <laughs> there, there's a monthly uh, retro hacker space called Signals and Noises. Um, people are bringing their retro computer hardware to the laboratory and working on them, exchanging parts, uh, programming, then repairing. Um, 
quarterly I'm doing a game circuit, operative game analysis um, um, about different topic of computer games uh, with a close look on the games, its codes and so on. And then there's a yearly Vintage Computing Festival. Um, this year uh, uh, had been the second um, uh, festival. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, and there are, of course, student and researchers projects permanently um, placed in the laboratory too. Mm. At the game circuits, this here are two examples. Uh, um, we are focusing on aspects of computer games. Um, as you can see on the right side, uh, on bugs, glitches, and cheats. Um, we try to find out how uh, bugs, glitches, and cheats are working with games and um, are embedded in game code or in um, um, circuitry design. We try to hack them so that they are glitchy and uh, learn about it's like this, an epistemological question. A buggy uh, program or a buggy game tells more of its own character than a functioning computer software. So on the right side there was a game circuit about simulation. This is, I think, a little computer people on an Apple IIe um, with a sign that, that says, uh, there, es gibt kein richtiges Leben im Falschen. That's a quote from Adorno, I think. Um, the Vintage Computing Festival is every um, first weekend in October, you're invited to come. Um, we've got uh, thousands of guests and international guests uh, um, at the exhibitor, exhibitors and at the visitor site. Um, there are talks and uh, programming and other workshops for children and um, adults. Um, this, this year we first had a conference, a conference on a computer historical topic actualized like um, archaeology uh, would do it um, on uh, um, this year was on uh, 50 years of time sharing and we had some veterans of time sharing systems and some new thoughts on time uh, times in computer and computer software um, the um, um, the videos of the talks are all online if you're interested you can uh, take a look next year's conference will be about ELISA and the uh, connection between computer language computer and speech yeah, here are some pictures uh, from this year's computer, Vintage Computing Festival. Um, as you can see, uh, loads of hardware and software and users are coming to Berlin to show their output, their new projects. And uh, um, on the upper side right, there's a gaming room with historical game consoles and uh, uh, every time, every year filled with uh, young and old people to play old computer games. And the other projects we did, um, here are some examples. Um, um, this is a um, reinstallation of the famous old Tennis for Two game for analog computers. We've got several analog computers working there in the Signal Laboratory. And as one of the projects I uh, managed, uh, some students and me um, programmed this game on the Telefunken uh, um, 742 analog computer. We made ourselves some uh, controllers to to shoot the ball, and um, um, this game, game was exhibited in the Computerspiele Museum in Berlin for several weeks, uh, so the visitors of the, the, visitors of the museum could um, play that, those, this old game too. Um, another thing I did with the um, Department for Physics is the opening of an old SRAM chip. This is a, a, a 2114 SRAM chip. Um, um, it's um, part of the Pac-Man project because this is the, this is the uh, RAM that is used on the Pac-Man board and we wanted to know where Pac-Man is when he is not on the screen. He must be anywhere, anywhere in the RAM and we'd like to go deeper and deeper into the electronics and uh, search for Pac-Man and so we had to open one of these um, SRAM chips to take a look on this uh, matrix at, that you can see on the right side. And uh, yeah, we found Pac-Man, um, but not on this uh, chip, um, but with our uh, oscilloscopes and logic analyzers, we could detect him uh, anywhere in the game. Um, there are lectures and performances in our signal laboratory. Um, at the left, you can see um, one of our friends, uh, Benjamin Heidersberger, who made himself an analog computer in, when he was 15 uh, to um, 
um, to make more re, uh, graphics, and he is working on this analog computer until today. Uh, now he's got some very fine lasers from China and uh, put the, the lasers on the uh, analog computer and um, uh, draws or burns more rays into our wall. Um, on the right side there was a project um, about jumping balls in computers. This is a very huge history in computer uh, and um, computer graphic and computer software um, history uh, from the 1940s to the late 80s. Everyone wanted to jump, let uh, uh, balls jump on his screen or in, on his light diodes or others. Mm. Um, some uh, two student projects um, are here shown on the left side. There is one of our students, he's a photographer, and he's, he's, he tries to um, think about um, the, the, design, uh, the computer as a design object. Um, he comes with his uh, photo apparatuses and uh, tents and lights and um, photographs our computers. And this, the project is ongoing, so I can't say anything about the results. Um, but I can uh, speak about the results from the right thing. This is a very practical aspect of software, um, uh, archaeology and software. Um, uh, as you can see, the, the only German game console, the Intertone VC4000, which ha has around, around about uh, 35 um, games on modules, but there, there's no way to do uh, new games on it because you can't produce the models anymore. And so uh, one of our students made a multi-ROM module. I don't know if you know about this. There you can do, there you can save um, ROM images from uh, uh, software images, disk images on the, mo on the um, module and can load them in the original hardware. And um, one of uh, the things we first did, we uh, programmed the Flappy Birds for this console. So now it got a new game and this is Flappy Birds. Okay, mm, I think my time is over. Um, mm, if you like to talk about the theory that's behind um, our teaching and our um, lab projects, uh, we can do this in the aftermath. Um, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, next up is Darren Welschler who's one of the locals. Uh, Darren is Concordia University Research in Media and Contemporary Literature, as well as the Provost's Fellow for Interdisciplinarity. And uh, he, with Charles Ackland, um, Darren is the co-founder co and co-coordinator of the Media, um, Media History Research Center at Concordia, and author and editor of a lot of books. I'm gonna just mention one. Um, is a brilliant book, The Iron Whim, A Fragmented History of Typewriting. Um, today's talk um, by Darren is titled Media Labs and Grey Literature. So it's all yours. Thank you. Um, listening to Stefan and Laura, Lori made me very happy, which is difficult because what I want to talk about today is kind of boring and sad. Um, the other night we, we did a, a panel uh, on a sort of similar kind of topic around a, a book that Laurie and you see and I are, are writing called The Lab Book. And I started out at the other end of the telescope from where I want to start today, talking about the mythology of the laboratory. And I want to go sort of right down to the other end and, and, and talk about infrastructure and a, a particular kind of infrastructure. So the question that I was working with in terms of trying to frame this is, what transforms a room full of miscellaneous hardware and bodies into a media lab, and the answer that I came up with is discourse, especially the discourse found in gray literature and the information genres that it embodies. So you know what gray literature is intimately, even if you don't want to think about it too hard. Uh, gray literature is non-conventional, fugitive, and sometimes ephemeral forms of publication, which might include, but is not limited to, reports, preprints, preliminary progress and advanced reports, technical reports, statistical reports, memoranda, state-of-the-art reports, market research reports, theses, conference proceedings, technical specifications and standards, non-commercial translations, bibliography, technical and commercial documentation, and official documents not published commercially, primarily government reports and documents. Um, 
Information genres is a similar term uh, uh, that comes from the work of John Guillory. Information genres are a kind of fuzzy middle zone on the spectrum be between literary writing and scientific writing. Information genres are, are te textual forms, memos, forms, reports, and so on, that we pretend have been flensed of all rhetorical value in order to better convey that peculiar modern invention that we call information. So gray literature speaks for media labs, especially but not exclusively in the context of universities. It is the discourse of mission statements, grant applications, annual reports, and web pages. It makes claims to ideological state apparatuses and other forms of institutions about how a lab produces and circulates knowledge and expects the gift of legitimization in return. This constitutive relationship between labs and gray literature is most visible in the specific cases of media labs housed inside universities, which of course actually run on gray literature, but I'd argue that it is never entirely absent in even the most iconoclastic and alternative of lab spaces. A couple of years ago, just after Alien Phenomenology was published, we invited Ian Bogost up to Concordia to do a few talks, and one of the seminars that he delivered had to do with the process that he calls carpentry, uh, the construction of our artifacts as a kind of philosophical practice. Uh, bears a kind of family resemblance to what many people in Montreal have come to call research creation. Now, the hard question that he posed to himself was whether objects in and of themselves were capable of making arguments, which I think is a very different question than whether objects have agency. He noted that even scientists still have to resort to writing at some point to communicate the results of their activities because the objects in their experiments are mute without being articulated to some form of professional discourse. Journal articles, book chapters, newspapers, and other kinds of popular journalism describe what labs, ha labs have accomplished, but I think that it's gray literature that makes labs into labs in the first place. It organizes the jumble of objects, practices, techniques, discourse, and su discourses, and subjects inst inst into institutionally recognizable forms. Now, none of this, of course, requires that the people filling out the forms need to believe what they're writing. Passion, conviction, and good intent have nothing to do with this, which is partly why it's called gray in the first place. All that matters is that the forms and reports have been completed, accepted, filed, and processed, and continue to appear according to the institutional timetable in question. The job of gray literature is to fade into the background. It is a conduit that powers the claims of the laboratory and its denizens with the silent assent of the accrediting institution. So how do we begin to discuss this aspect of Media Labs when its precise job is to fade into the background, passing itself off as something too mundane to worry about? We are now quite familiar with methods for thinking about subjects, discourses, material objects, articulations, assemblages, and cultural techniques. What's necessary to theorize the role that cultural techniques play in the production of media labs as labs, I think, is what Jeffrey Bowker and Susan Lee Starr refer to as an infrastructural inversion. Gray literature is, as I'm going to argue, the pivotal component in the infrastructure of a lab of any sort, a sort of articulation that makes the productive work of the lab possible. Our job is to be able to adequately describe both the work of production and the work of articulation in this scene. So in this instance, Bowker and Starr are more helpful than, say, McLuhan's notion of the figure ground inversion because they provide both an account of the properties of infrastructure and a set of methods for beginning to discern it. As I've already pointed out through the example of gray literature, infrastructure is difficult to observe because it is built upon some sort of pre-existing base. It is embedded into other structures, technologies, and social arrangements, which it connects to in a standardized fashion. It is, in fact, also the embodiment of standards and protocols themselves. Because it does not have to be reassembled or reinvented every time a task is performed, it tends toward transparency, becoming really visible only at the moments of breakdown, lag, and other kinds of failure. Despite its low profile, it extends beyond single events, practices, and sites. It is shaped by and shapes in turn specific communities of practice, and often the only way to learn its intricacies is through membership in those communities, where it also performs a kind of gatekeeping function, indicating who does or does not have membership and therefore access to space like, spaces like labs. Yet no one is really in charge of it, and the only way to adapt it or fix it is in very small increments. 
So given that it's possible to find the gray literature around both contemporary and historical media labs in the backs of long forgotten filing cabinets, used bookstores, and increasingly in the hastily digitized and unsorted stacks of digital repositories such as archive.org, what do we do with it? Bowker and Starr have some suggestions in this respect as well. And first and foremost, making a surprise guest appearance after its long banishment by German materialities of communication theory, the first technique that Bowker and Starr suggest is close reading. The use of passive voice, the combination of a set of actions into a single actor, such as science, as in science does this or science wants that, which is then treated as though it has a volition of its own. The reduction of complex assemblages into monolithic forms. All of these rhetorical gestures indicate that something is being excluded or left unnamed. Behind that exclusion will be some sort of ideological imperative structured by a master narrative that close reading should be able to identify. In a similar manner, an analysis of gray literature should also involve a hunt for the work that it makes invisible and the workers whose labor is discounted or is not formally recognized. Who cleans the lab? who types up the reports and makes the phone calls bothering the PI until they finally fill in the forms, who patches the software and runs the cables, who watches the kids during crunch time. The production of gray literature, it seems, involves considerable amounts of affective labor, which at least we now have a critical language to describe. The final note in Starr's uh, uh, sort of pivotal article, The Ethnography of Infrastructure, provides one more reason that we tend to ignore the gray literature around uh, any technology, laboratories included. Infrastructure functions as a toll gate. It makes it possible for some people and objects to enter a lab in order to court certain kinds of possibilities, but it simultaneously keeps other people, things, and possibilities out. One of the things that it has kept out so far is scrutiny of the formal properties of gray literature. But if we're going to take media labs or any labs as an object of study, that barrier has to become a bridge. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Um, our fourth intervention, short talk, is from Jesper Olsson from Sweden. Brief introduction to Jesper. Um, Jesper works at Linköping University in Sweden as an associate professor, and he leads the research group on literature, media history, and information cultures, and also the research project on representations and reconfigurations of the digital in Swedish literature and art in 1952 to 2010. Um, he's visited the US many times as a research fellow. He writes not only academic texts, but also as a literary critic. Um, just to mention a kind of example of his academic writing, um, he, his most recent, uh, latest book was on the tape record as an aesthetic technology. And what's interesting in this context is that Jesp has been working on, on, on building a media lab or something of the sort, or media archaeology lab in Linköping, and it's all yours, Jesper, tell us more. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Jussi. Uh, yeah, in distinction to uh, Laurie and Stefan, I will, I'm going to present something that don't exist yet, um, a project that I began uh, working on about a year and a half ago, uh, which is an attempt to establish, as Jussi just mentioned, a media archaeology lab in, at Linköping University in Sweden, uh, in collaboration with a computer museum uh, in the same city. Uh, the plan is to set up a lab space uh, where media are explored through materially based investigations, experiments, and play, and where humanities scholars and students, but also potentially computer scientists and engineers, uh, can collaborate with artists and poets, and even with the public. Uh, the lab is to be housed off campus in the Art Museum downtown. And you can see it on the screen over here. It's a, my first postcard from Sweden in this presentation. Uh, where the computer museum is situated as well. The lab is thus to be incorporated into an already existing architecture and infrastructure, and in connection to the museum's uh, collection of computers, software, and related electronic devices. And there you have a slide from the uh, computer museum. Uh, there. Uh, so far, I have received funding to arrange some seminars and symposia 
about the lab, and Jussi and Lori has been our guests there. Uh, and at the outset, the possibilities of, re possibilities of realizing the project seem quite good. Everyone's extremely positive. Uh, but there are, of course, challenges and obstacles as well. And I'm going to address a few of them here, but I will mainly talk about the driving forces behind the project and uh, the historical and material context, uh, the specific context in Linköping for its implementation. Uh, first of all, though, I have to underline that my own personal experience of the practice-based methods that are usually pursued in labs of this kind, as Stefan presented some of them here, uh, my experience is of this is extremely limited. Uh, my own background is in literature. Uh, my plans are thus cluttered by tentative ideas and small and big questions uh, concerning everything from uh, the need to expand the field of the humanities uh, to issues about shares and shelves and so on. Uh, but there are, of course, aspects of my previous work that have made me moving in this direction uh, uh, for the last year and the last couple of years. Uh, my, own research, my own research has always been informed by uh, materialist media theories, and not least the German versions. And it has, to a large extent, focused on the impact of media technologies uh, on literature and art. For example, I have written about uh, avant-garde poetry and office supplies, and on the tape recorder, as you just mentioned, as an aesthetic technology during the Cold War period. Even more importantly, I would say, in this regard, I have for a long time been engaged in editing and publishing uh, a magazine and a small press. And this is truly a hands-on and, and emphatically embodied practice that makes you attuned to the effects of tech technical infrastructure and material materiality on many levels on all kinds of uh, cultural practice and thinking and scholarship as well. Uh, my work with the journal OEI, and you can see some of it on the slide there, uh, ha has since the start in 1999 been informed by these issues and has also been inflected by uh, media theory and by the editorial offices, research bureaus, and various ense ensembles for collaborative work and technological tinkering uh, within the avant-garde during the last century from Dada and the Surrealists to Ulipu and uh, contemporary collectives such as uh, Christophe Anas La Rédaction, who, who actually works with the kind of great literature that Darren just uh, discussed, uh, this kind of memos and, and, and forms and so on. Uh, this context in which artists and critics explore both affirmative and critical relationship to the lab as a conceptual and methodological framework if not an actual site, uh, provides an important background to my plans then. Beyond this, I have uh, certainly also looked at other existing labs for inspiration, uh, not least the Fundus, presented by Stefan, Stefan and in Berlin, and, and, and of course the Mal that Lori presented in Boulder, which she, she has run since 2009. Uh, Against this background, I have tried to pin down some of the epistemic gains and potentials of a lab, a media archaeological lab as I see it, as an inventory of arguments for pursuing this work for myself. And I will mention some of them before uh, going into the specific conditions for a lab in Linköping. And I don't think really this list contains any surprises to you, but still. Uh, First, hooking up with Wolfgang Ernst's media archaeology, the materialist investigation of the specific ontology and functionalities of the machine made possible in the lab will also give an opportunity to a more fine-grained analysis of how media shape temporalities, perception, thinking, effective structural, cultural practice, and so on. Secondly, materialist tinkering with media objects provide a richer visual, acoustic, haptic, and tactile, etc., experience of the media in question, which will add something I'm sure, uh, to the discursive analysis uh, performed in off-lab academic, academic studies. Uh, moreover, and, more, and a more negative take on the materiality, uh, so to speak, the recontextualization of the media technologies from their use and circulation in everyday life 
to the lab environment will make them partially opaque and thus potentially generate new knowledge. Next point, a similar defamiliarization process between the humanities and the sciences is at stake here. By rerouting methods, procedures, and concepts from the latter to the former, hidden potentials of our, our work as humanities, humanities scholars might be discovered. And in all these instances, it is obvious, as I would say, that something can be learned from literature and art and, and the materialist imagination there. Uh, Another crucial point for me is to conceive of the lab as the construction of an alternative post-Habermasian public space for dissemination of knowledge. Uh, and this is certainly pressing issues for univers universities in general today due to the changes in the field of knowledge production and due to the transformation of the public sphere, of course. Lastly, one might perhaps see the lab also as a space for innovation in a certain sense, in a, engineering and economic sense perhaps, for designing, as, as a space for, for designing new objects, for example. At least I have been thinking about this since uh, I bumped into Stephen Jackson's essay on broken world thinking and repair as a kind of uh, condition for innovation, which actually sits quite well with the kind of uh, tinkering going on in a media archaeology lab. Uh, Apart from our own research background and the more general ideas just outlined, there are also more spe specific uh, conditions uh, for the lab in Linköping. Uh, first of all, the city of Linköping has a long cultural history, but one of its late modern hallmarks is the uh, Corporation Saab. And there's another slide there. You can see Linköping on the Swedish Sweden map there as well, so you can place it. Um, uh, the corporation Saab, famous for its manufacture of cars, of course, uh, and military aircrafts. Uh, but in the mid-1950s, or even the early, mid, early 50s, the company also began to build its own computers, which, be, which would become an integral part of the building of the post-war infrastructure in Sweden. Uh, so when the city of Linköping got its university in the late 60s and early 70s, the emphasis was very much on engineering and science, but it would also come to be characterized by uh, the exploration and use of new media technologies in teaching, for example, and most notably, perhaps, uh, by cross-disciplinarity, as they call it, which was actually built into the organizational structure of the new university through the, the building of thematic departments on such things as technique and social change, gender, water studies, and so on. Uh, and when the computer museum, my partner then, uh, opened 11 years ago, this was also the result of a joint venture between uh, 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 the corporation Saab and the university. There is thus a regional industrial and media technological history to take into account in planning this uh, specific lab. Uh, Moreover, it is also possible to find a common ground between this history of technology, cultural history, and the history of the avant-garde art in Sweden. At the same time as Saab computers became invaluable for, for the economy and the in industry and so on, uh, cultural critics in Sweden observed and discussed the emergence of a new media society with crucial epistemic consequences. For example, as a political investigation in the late 60s in Sweden stated, through the gradual disappearance of the book and the replacement of the library, or as we say in Swedish, bibliotek, bibliotek uh, with a mediatek, a mediatek, new forms of knowledge and learning uh, will emerge. And this was, of course, also the time when concrete poets, uh, visual artists, and conceptual artists, and so on, and experimental composers and partly in collaboration with people like Billy Cleaver and EAT, whom we heard about yesterday, began to explore new technology and the computer as an artistic co-creator. And the Saab computers were uh, a part of this. Um, for instance, in 1966, the programmer Gunnar Hellström and the engineer Göran Sundqvist used the D21 computer, which, which had been launched in 1962 and was the uh, first commercial computer in Sweden, I think. 
Um, they got together to compose what is probably the first computer-generated poem in Swedish, uh, D21 Nam. And I don't know about the title, but Nam probably refers to the Vietnam War, I would say. Uh, the work was made for the conference uh, Visions of the Present, or Visions of the Now, actually, in Stockholm. And it was part of a session called Algorithms in Art. Today, only fragments of this poetry, poetry are preserved, but one of my doctoral students has, together with an artist and programmer, began to investigate this uh, piece through a media archaeological approach, one might say, and they will look into the possibilities of uh, reverse engineering this piece with the help from uh, older, uh, but, but still uh, living engineers from, uh, from Saab. Uh, This kind of collaborative material work is, as I mentioned, one of the things that, that I hope will be achieved through the lab. But, it, but it, it will also be set up as a partly public space, as I mentioned before, through readings, seminars, workshops, and so on. Perhaps something close to the hybrid space that Jeffrey Schnapp in his latest book calls a library, like this kind of uh, portmanteau word for public library and lab. Uh, the lab will thus tie into the current discussion of public humanities and, and citizen science, and as I mentioned, can be seen as an effort to construct an alternative public space. But in, in distinction to web-based similar initiatives, uh, a lab explores, of course, the material materially situated and local as a platform for knowledge production and dissemination. It goes for the unubiquitous, as Garnet Hirsch suggested uh, when he was visiting us in, in Linköping in September which is of course critical in a time when knowledge is sometimes regarded as uh, utterly translatable and transmittable. So then, uh, what questions and obstacles do I grapple with? Well, first of all, most of what I've said here can be problematized, of course, but there are also a number of as yet unmentioned questions and not least practical issues. How to staff the lab, for example, what kind of people is necessary to make it running? Uh, what kind of equipment is necessary, uh, or furniture. Uh, as Patrick Svensson, the founder of the Hum Lab in Umeå in Sweden, has underlined, the ideas and the epistemic convictions, uh, commitments promoted and pursued by a lab will also be embodied in the arrangement of bookshelves and seminar tables and so on. Moreover, is it necessary or perhaps improductive to strive for an incorporation of the lab into an existing inst institutional structure are looser, more flexible, or nomadic solutions preferable? And how to describe in a more detailed way the methodological and epistemic gains with the Media Archaeology Lab, and how to distinguish it from maker spaces and some kinds of DH labs, for example? Is it important to do this at all, or are such questions just, re such questions just relevant in a funding context? And now that that's been mentioned, how to translate the above into a persuasive argument calibrated for a humanities funding context where bigger global infrastructures and databases and projects with a quantifiable impact are always privileged. I'm confident that, confident that there is an answer to this, but uh, I will stop now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jesper. Our uh, fifth intervention talk is by Iwasha Karusa, another person I had the pleasure of collaborating over the years. Um, Iwasha works, is, well, Iwasha is basically an academic and a curator. She's able to kind of a talk towards both worlds. She works at Liverpool John Moores University, but also at Liverpool Biennale, where she's the director of the Exhibition Research Center and head of research at the Biennale. Um, Yosha is very well known in the curator world with her, through her work as an artistic director at Kunsthal Aarhus, but also um, through her work as part of the curatorial team for Document 13, um, where she worked on, on Erki Kurenniemi, and based on that we also co-edited together a book on Erki Kurenniemi that we will be talking about later. Um, I'll hand it over to you, Yosha. Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. You were not talking about me, were you? Um, so it's easy to see why am I last in this panel, really, as we're moving from uh, some very concrete, realized ideas, fascinating ones, 
to, ima to uh, projects in progress, but already quite, is quite concrete and established, to something that I'm going to present, which is partly in my head, partly speculative, and um, I'm proposing an exercise in imagining something, maybe. <laughs> Only maybe. So in response to this invitation to the panel, um, as I've mentioned, I would like to propose a slightly different perspective, and I hope somewhat relevant, a perspective that makes connection between the field of media archaeology and curating through thinking about exhibition as a potential space for lab. So curating historical, historical material through exhibition which then might or might not become something close to lab. And the inspiration and the reference is the project that I was involved as, uh, as part of a curatorial team for um, an exhibition, which is large-scale periodic art exhibition that takes place in Kassel every five years. And that was in 2012, so it's quite an old project already, where I worked um, on a number of media, you can say, I'm quoting, media, archaeological exhibitions, like the one that the slide you can see on the screen is an exhibition of a German artist, David Link, entitled Love Letters, where he reconstructed an original machine from 1950s um, we, and uh, restored a software which produced, known to be one of the first softwares, I wouldn't say first, but probably one of the very first software to write love letters. That's how it looked. But I would like to focus on another project, um, which I would like to elaborate on for its lab-like form, uh, which was a retrospective of the Finnish artist, archivist, technology pioneer, uh, musician, electronic music pioneer, scientist and visionary of the 1960s, Erki Kuraniemi. And Yussi mentioned we have a book that we will be launching in the afternoon, so um, some self-promotion here is due. That's, that's Erki Kuraniemi Lab, or actually studio, music studio. So the exhibition um, of his work at Documenta, in Documenta, was interestingly placed in the Orangery, which is mu a Museum of Technology itself. And this provided inspiration for me to consider the idea of exhibition in terms of media archaeology lab. So a little bit about the exhibition and Erki Kuraniemi. Um, Kuraniemi's work is particularly interesting in this regard as an example of an artist technologist working in a curatorial-like manner in his own and his own use of the studio lab, studio slash lab, as his side of production to conduct his scientific slash artistic experiments. The spaces seem to combine and overlap through his various practices. Some examples of his um, machines, electronic synthesizers. So exhibition and doc in documenta uh, include historical materials such as films, objects, written diaries, audio tapes, machines, music synthesizers, and it all happened in a very processual manner. His 1960s and 70s synthesizers were reconstructed and reconnected as in his original studio, but through current technology and through the work of contemporary young generation artist, Tara Katui, Lebanese artist, and together, so that's how it looked, um, diagram of reconnecting, so first restoring and then reconnecting, and this is how we looked in, in, in an exhibition space. So together, those instruments were played from time to time over an entire period of three months of exhibition in Kassel. So that's one example of a um, slightly more dynamic approach to exhibition space. And then at the same time, his archives, Kuraniemi's archives, um, I should add that Erki Kuraniemi is um, known for his uh, obsessive archiving of his life and life in general. He created vast amounts of documents. Uh, he shot something like 20,000 photographs a year. 
recorded diaries um, on tapes, on videotapes, on audio tapes, written diaries, uh, computer notes, and various other documents. And this ar archive is placed now in a collection of um, National Finnish Gallery in Helsinki. And we were very lucky to be able to have access to this material to, to work um, with this material for the exhibition. But also, we decided to commission young generation artists, programmers, a group called Constant, based in Brussels, to actually deal with this material and do something with it in a more uh, contemporary way. And I should also explain that Erki Kuraniemi, the driving idea behind his archiving, as we, um, as he says or said, was idea of recreating, generating enough of material to be able to recreate a human life or create a template for human life for the future generations. So when there's no one else left on the planet, quantum computers might be able to recreate something that resembles um, what was once known as human life. So um, Kuraniemi himself is no longer able to do that, so he is not working on this project anymore. However, we've commissioned a group of artists constant to take on this task. So they started. <laughs> but I won't go into detail of this project. This is just an example of uh, how um, an old material becomes something else and is reenacted through contemporary practices for an exhibition. So where does it leave us with? Um, it leaves us with a lot of questions. This example, example leaves us with a lot of question, questions. First of all, how useful it is to describe exhibition lab in the first place? Why would we do that? And to what extent the exhibition can simultaneously be the site of display and production, a lab? and in what sense. And it's reverse, how and to what extent a lab can simultaneously be the site of exhibition, to expose the process, to expose it as a research, as an epistemological space, this place of a research process, for instance. An exhibition, artist studio gallery, and indeed the exhibition can function as a site within which art can be produced and can be generated. A particular understanding of lab as applied to science, treated as neutral spaces where experiments can be repeated and measurable, but of course they are not neutral spaces. Indeed, they are socially constructed. As we know from cultural approaches to science, for example, Bruno Latour, scientific and technological research and cultural activities are imbued with creativity and critical comment, like any other cultural activity, such as art. In his book, Science as Action, published in English in 1987, Latour argues that persons, organizations, funders, and materials combine to shape scientific theory. The Media Archaeology Lab, even in its name, would seem to acknowledge itself as a site of mediation in this way, where theory and practice come together and where phenomena are excavated for their underlying discursive and non-discursive layers. That brings me to my current context where I work, which is Liverpool, John Morris University, and Liverpool Biennial. Uh, so more currently, I have been asked to uh, run something that doesn't exist, actually. Um, it was supposed to be Exhibition Research Center, which produced some exhibitions. Now it is going to be Exhibition Research Lab. And I don't know what it will be at this stage. Out, apart from Exhibition Research Lab, Contemporary Art Lab, there is Fact Lab, there is Face Lab, and lots of other labs in, within the school. Together, all very trendy references to relational practices and process-driven artistic and curatorial production and artistic and curatorial slash exhibition research. Also, makerspaces and fab labs. So to what extent can the exhibition or the gallery simultaneously be conceptualized as a research lab and to what effect. So this is how the actual physical space looks like. It is a gallery. It has been conceived as a gallery, but currently it's used for various purposes, including research workshops that we just ran last week. 
So returning to Latour, he develops the methodological statement that science and technology must be situated in action or in the making. Things have to be studied where discoveries are made in practice. So despite the tendency to refer to labs in the arts, what about a close study of the art room, studio, in parallel to the science lab? And this can be extended to the exhibition as a specific set of material practices which then in turn might lead to thinking about the role of experimentation more closely. If science tends towards providing or false, sorry, towards proving or falsifying something through repeatable experiments, then how to characterize artistic experimentation or curatorial experimentation? From the arts, From the arts, there is an emphasis on work in progress, open-ended rather than prescriptive modes, means and process rather than ends or end products. Not simply the logic of cause and effect, but following different kinds of methodologies that expose the material discursive conditions through which the exhibition are produced and make meaning. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much, all of our speakers, for the interventions and the, the, the kind of entry points. To we have some time for discussion. What already emerged, at least to my ears, was, well, for instance, what Yoasha already alluded to is the kind of parallel both discourses, but also the histories that lab has in relation to the studio, the exhibition, which kind of begs the question as well, and what was coming out in different ways, it begs the question is that what are the specific histories of the lab in relation to what sort of practices and why, what would be the alternative, alternative than the science lab as a model for knowledge creation that the actual humanities labs are do, working with as well. And of course the relation to critical making and other sort of practices that we've been talking about in this conference as well. It seems that the lab is a place where humanities wants to be reinvented, Laurie referred to that as well. And there's something interesting also what Jesper brought to us and also what was present in, in, in Stefan's as well is that what is the role of the lab in relation to public institutions and also national narratives sometimes, including also the kind of imagination which was an administrative imagination of the lab where it gets summoned, Darren referred to that and infrastructure as well. Um, but I want to it open to audience as well. If you already have questions and ideas that you want to bring to the table, we're very willing to engage in that discussion. These are just kind of the thoughts that I had, not as questions, but as a context from those talks. So please, audience as well, or the panelists, if you want to start addressing each other as well, because it's supposed to be a conversation. This is a question. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Thank you all. Um, you all sort of gestured to the rhetoric of the lab, obviously. Uh, Darren addressed it uh, most directly, um, which I, I think is inseparable from this idea of the lab as a proposition, um, always under development and never an assertion. Science does. Um, and following that, I'm wondering if you had any comment on the role of metaphor in the lab, where metaphor is sort of a, a more liberated mode of communication that, that almost reads as proposal. Very good. Well, I, I was sort of struck by uh, Joasia's how the Liverpool Exhibition Research Center has suddenly become an exhibition research lab. And it sort of left me wondering, well, is there anything that is not a lab now in the same way that suddenly everyone was a curator or everything was artisanal? Like, it, it, and this, this is why it strikes me as like, it's like a discursive problem and a, and a metaphorical problem because there are certain kinds of claims that go along with those metaphors in terms of what we're doing. And, and it, it, I mean, at the end of the day, it has to be a discursive issue because there's no there there. Like, if anything can be a lab, it's not essential to the objects in the room or the people in the room or the space. It's about the way that that particular articulation is connected metaphorically and discursively. And I, I mean, 
I, one of the things that sort of interests me on a metaphorical level is that the, the institutional kind of work that the, you know, calling something a lab does, like it legitimizes what you're doing within a discourse of scientificity at a particular cultural moment when the academy at least is becoming more and more instrumental and we're having to make certain kinds of claims about the practicality of what the humanities does. So in a weird kind of way, after decades of critiquing positivism and deconstruction and all of those kinds of things, we suddenly went, no, wait, let's just grab that whole language from over there and use it as a way of legitimizing this weird and flaky enterprise that we've sort of set out upon. So yeah, metaphor is incredibly important. <laughs> Can you briefly, Yosha, can you just elaborate? It, do you have a comment in terms of, because I'm interested, in, what is the currency, what is the purchase power of the lab in relation to contemporary art world as well? Why, 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 because we, this is the thing, is that it really spreads from the university environment that is one of the kind of key contexts we've been discussing, and then there's the labs in relation to creative ma uh, critical making, and that would go back to issues of hack spaces or hack labs, but how about then the art world? Why labs, or is it exactly what Darren said? Yeah, I think I think this is very interesting points you've made about um, there is this there is this institutional side to it. So obviously, and it, in particular in UK, there, we, it, there is a particular point in time that humanities and art departments and and the, where I work, it's called Liverpool School of Art and Design. So these are all very particular conditions within which we operate. So there's a lot of pressure on rethinking cultural and artistic activity in relation to more pressing agendas that universities are on. So that's definitely part of the answer for that. At the same time, I think this provides the, um, and I was thinking about it, we, we were we're going through this exercise of rethinking the whole school in relation to its research and how artistic research, so it links to much wider discussions of how artistic research is seen as research and knowledge production um, in a more, you know, in relation to more conventional forms of knowledge production. And there has been a lot of discussion. I mean, the last Documenta 13 devoted, you know, a lot of space of talking about artistic work, artistic, artistic process and art as uh, related to research. So that's, that's in this context. For us, at the same time, you know, Liverpool School of Art of, of Design is one of the, I think it's the oldest art school outside of London, or one of the oldest art schools outside of London. Liverpool is a particular con has a particular context. It's a city that rebranded itself in relation to cultural activities, so regeneration agendas in relation to uh, culture. The city has been almost extinct in, you know, uh, in various periods, in, in particular through Thatcher uh, uh, attempt to, um, yes, in Thatcher times. So the city rebranded itself, there is Tate Liverpool, we have Tate Liverpool, we have Liverpool Biennial, which I am part of, um, then there is Reba North, which is Royal Institute of British Architects in, in Liverpool, and there is also FACT, uh, Foundation for Art and Technology. And they all have labs. They have research labs and, and uh, technology labs and so on. So obviously there is a lot of pressure on following this sort of line of rethinking itself in, in the current context. But at the same time, so there is a lot of institutional politics. At the same time, for me personally, um, and I jumped to this opportunity having uh, previously running um, an art gallery, Kunsthall in Denmark for four years, um, I jumped to this opportunity because I jumped to this because it's an opportunity for me to actually rethink the idea of an exhibition space, a gallery. So there is a gallery that produces exhibitions, more or less boring, more or less interesting, more or less research or not research based. And you come to a point that you start questioning why are we doing this? Uh, and why are we doing this in a space that is in between the institution and the public? And the Actually, we do have a window to the street, so that's interesting. So that's an opportunity, and I don't know where would it lead, but I would like to use it as a, as a way of um, rethinking. And what struck me is from the previous presentation is uh, the comment about public space. So uh, providing an opportunity for what's going on at the university, what's going on in terms of exhibition 
thinking about exhibitions in relation to public? And I know I haven't answered the question, but it's just a set of thoughts. Mm -hmm.